Right to a channel of like fluid. Yes, once again it's time to head out on our distant travels. And if you remember, we're about to meet some more of the crew when we left things off for the last time. So I'm not gonna bother with the introduction too much. Let's get to meeting the crew. The morning comes fast, but you feel rested. You must have slept well. The morning after. You and Nick decided to grab breakfast at the cafe where Commander Steele interviewed you last night. You caught up fast. Seems like your interviews were similar, but Nick had been interviewed by a large tiger. Yeah, that was interesting. Something fell off during the entire interview. When he revealed that he wasn't human, what well, took me a minute to realise I wasn't dreaming. He's huge. He almost scared me when I still thought he was human. So when he appeared as a tiger. I'm so surprised I managed to remain as calm as I did. <laughs> I think you got a scarier experience than I did on that one. It definitely seemed like he wanted to make sure I was ready for anything. That or he just liked scaring me. In contrast to what Nick just told you, Commander Steele seemed gentle. There must be one scary tiger. It still feels very surreal to me. Hopefully I'll get to know more about it today. Nick looks like he's in deep thought for a moment. Uh, do you need a minute? Nick looks back towards you with an unexpected intensity in his eyes. What is happiness and what is fulfilment to you? The question caught you off guard. As in, can you be happy without being fulfilled? And can you be fulfilled without being happy? I remember a deep conversation with you. We were both pretty drunk, but something you said struck me. You said, sometimes I feel like there's no place in this world for people like me. And I can't help but wonder, what did you mean with people like you? You remember the conversation. It was when you and Nick had just started connecting. I was pretty depressed at the time, but the same feeling still remains after the fact. Okay. For some reason, even though I know it should not, it still hurts saying it out loud. Lonely, stuck in a job which isn't moving forward in a small town. What prospects are there? What am I supposed to aim for? Where am I supposed to go? Things would be easier if I was straight. Damn. Didn't mean to let that last part out. Might as well let it all out now. Maybe Nick has some insight. He clears a place he wants to bring this conversation. We could go forward in life, trying to earn as much money as possible while worrying about little else. Get a pretty wife. Raise a few kids, an older girl and a younger boy. And focus on making them happy. That'd be fulfilment, wouldn't it? I'm fairly sure that'd be happiness. Well, that's not you, is it? No. It's not. So what do you want to do in life? What's the end game? I want to change the world. I want to make an impact, something lasting. Something that makes life better for everyone. What about love? I'd like to be loved. I'd like to love. Was that happiness? I don't know. There would have to be that feeling of a happy ending. How would you know before you actually hit the end? You wouldn't. Here's what I think. Happiness is relative. Fulfillment is relative. It has to be what you make of it from your perspective. 
where you are right now. Your point of view, your dreams, your reality. You can be happy where you are right now, relative to where you want to be. I can make you happy. That's also why it's personal. It's all relative to you. Your wishes, your dreams, your wants. And I want to change the world. So, here's your chance. Fuck your doubts. Screw your fears. Your chance is there. Reach out and take it. Fuck the world that's keeping you back. Let's go to the stars. You've never seen Nick this passionate before about anything. You can't help but wonder. Nick, are you happy? I think I am. I have friends I like, my job I enjoy, and even a place where I'm liked. That's all I want. You know, you've seen me at my lowest point, Axel. That's really why I thought a lot about fulfilment. It makes me sad to hear it when you say you think there's no place for you. Regardless of what I think about that being true or not, here's a chance. Take it. I'm going to go. I said yes to going earlier. Aren't you happy here? I'm happy. I'm not fulfilled. I want to see how far I can go. I think all my friends will still be here when I come back. Do you have any doubts Julia will give me my old job back when I come back? You can't help but smile. That is true. No doubts. Let's do this. Let's go to the stars. It'd be quite the adventure. You finish up your breakfast and make your way to the hotel lobby. You wait for the commander together. As you wait, you can't ever get the feeling that you should probably be more scared than you are. But isn't that why they picked Nick and I? Commander Steele had mentioned it yesterday. The profiling test you did shows that the two of you will be able to handle it. What was it in this case? Aliens? The idea of space travel? Or the idea of world-ending creatures? I'm definitely not sure I can handle it. You look at Nick. Nick, can I ask you something? Nick looks at you. What's up? Do you have any doubts at all about this entire thing? What do you mean? As in, do you think we can handle everything? I feel like it's a lot to take in. You're right, but at the same time. No way to know but to take the leap, is there? I guess that's true. Silence falls for a minute. Eventually you look over at Nick again. Nick has a look of contemplation on his face. When the commander shows up, I wonder if I'll be seeing him as a human, or... I mean, I'd say I'm not interested in finding that out. What about the tiger that Nick mentioned? Or I see him as a human at first? Looks like I won't have to wait long to find out. You spot the big bear approaching you from across the hotel lobby. He stops and picks up a hat someone dropped, returning it. He then gives him a curt bow. That's very polite of him. He definitely sticks out now his device doesn't work on you. Nick lowers his voice. Nope, still human. That's one of many questions answered. You wonder how all the people around you would react if they could see what you're seeing. Maybe this is what the future holds. Maybe there have been people like the commander around all along and no one ever knew. Lions, tigers and bears, oh my. The same sentence you thought of earlier echoes in your mind. Only one way to find out. The commander arrives in front of you and greets you. Oh, good morning. He has a warm smile on his face. Did you two get enough rest? We had breakfast earlier. I'm rested and ready. Nick has a weird look on his face as he speaks. There should be no yawning from me today. 
The commander looks at Nick and raises an eyebrow. The Charles scare you that badly? I guess Charles is named the Big Tiger interviewed Nick. Nick sighs and responds to the commander's question. Yeah, a little bit, but he wasn't wrong. It's the commander's turn to sigh. Uh, I'd like to apologise to you, Nick. Dr. Stevenson can get... intense. He puts his hand on Nick's shoulder. Sorry. I should have waited and interviewed you myself. Oh, thank you, sir. It's cool. He did manage to convince me to say yes. And he is very informative. Mike smiles once more and moves his hand from Nick's shoulder. I'm glad. We're lucky to have you on board. Seeing how passionate he is about it all. You can't help but to wonder if Nick knows something you don't. Yes, I'll see. I get to meet this Dr. Stevenson today, that is. Now, where are we heading? We have our base of operations set up not too far away. It's within walking distance. Unless you two would prefer a call for a car. You look to Nick. I wouldn't mind a short walk. Uh, how about you, Nick? He didn't get a lot of sleep in the last few days. Oh, I'll be honest, I wouldn't mind a car this time. I can call for a taxi. Oh, don't worry about it. The commander sends a message on his phone. The car should be here in just a minute. If Charles did what I think he did yesterday, I doubt you got a lot of sleep. He gives Nick a look that portrays a certain level of guilt. Nick just gives him a smile in return. Oh, thank you, sir. The commander once again raises an eyebrow. You know, even though I'm now technically your superior, you can call me Mike if you'd like. Oh, thanks, Mike. The commander gives him a soft smile at that. You wait for a few minutes, making small talk. The commander asks you a few questions about the networks and tech you've worked with previously. He listens with great attention and asks a few questions. After a while, the commander receives a message on his phone. A car is waiting for us outside. Are you two ready to go? Ready as I can be. Are you excited as I am? I can't really deny that. I am. The two of you turn and follow your guide out of the hotel. And towards... Another limousine? Yes, that's just how things are from now on. The three of you get in the car. After a short car ride, you arrive at what looks to be a generic office building. Oh, we're here. The three of you enter the building together. Space Bear Productions? Really? He laughs at that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the crew voted for the name. Not that I tried to stop them. Not what I expected. Your first impression of the building interior is what you'd expect from most lobbies. There's a front desk man by lady who looks just like a librarian. A few places to sit and wait, or the nobody's waiting. There's also a security checkpoint with metal scanners. You would definitely have a hard time getting through the checkpoint you weren't supposed to. But it still doesn't look out of the ordinary for a large corporation. The commander checks you in with an ID card. And instead of going through security, you just walk to the side, then through a door and towards an elevator. After a quick elevator ride, you arrive at your destination, and the commander leads you out to the elevator. As you make your way into the upstairs lobby, you take in all the sights. They definitely have a large budget. The commander stops for a second and turns to Nick. Uh, one second. The commander touches his watch. Did he turn his stealth device off? You look to Nick, who's looking directly at the commander. That's a yes. The commander extends his arm for a handshake. A proper introduction is in order since we'll be working together soon. Nick takes a handshake. Nice to meet you, Nick. Thanks, Mike. 
Uh, now then. Might give you a wink. I can't help but ask. Is Space Bear Productions a real company? Just as the commander is about to answer, hear an energetic voice interject. It is! We make short stories about space. The commander doesn't say anything. Instead, he patiently waits for the young man who just approached you to finish. He looks to be a little younger than you. Mostly cute or fun stuff, like the lonely star who found friendship. Not sure I've ever heard about that story before. Well, it's a novel from the world we're from. I meet Max, a Brenton's navigator. He's young, but he's good at what he does. Nice to meet you. He puts his hand forward for a handshake. As you reach out to grab his hand, your vision fails you. It's like a sudden intrusion. Your vision of the young man in front of you seems to shift between different phases. His form shifts, but you're not sure until what. You look over to Nick and he gives you a strange look. Looks like whatever you're experiencing is not happening to him. Axel? Are you okay? You cover your eyes with your hand. This is not ideal. You try to gather your thoughts. But it's difficult. Crap. You start to wonder what's happening to you. Oh, are you alright? Crap. And then... A warm hand lands softly on your shoulder. A voice whispers in your ear, calmly. Imagine a dragon. A dragon? Yes. With black scales. An image is starting to form in your head. A dragon? What? He has yellow eyes. I guess he's not that far-fetched, all things considering. Imagine how he might look like. Make an image in your head. It doesn't have to make sense. Easier said than done. I'm already trying to. He's someone like me. He's not human. You word your thoughts. He's not human. You'll probably realize that your brain doesn't know where to place him yet. So imagine him. Give your idea form and shape. Just like if you were drawing a picture. You imagine how an artist paints, filling a canvas shape and colour. Take your time. Black scales and yellow eyes. And then, when you're ready, open your eyes and look carefully. You take another few seconds to gather your thoughts. It's easier now. You focus on the image in your head. And then, you take the leap and open your eyes. There he is. It was exactly like you had imagined. It's like your brain had taken the pieces in you was there and finally put them in all the right place. That was interesting. Oh, thanks. The commander gives you what is quickly becoming one of his trademark smiles. Oh, good job. Nick looks at you with slight worry. You feel better? Oh, much better. I'm guessing you didn't have that same experience. Uh, no, what happened? You turn to the young dragon. Max? Nick looks over to Max. Could you turn the uh, stealth device off? 
Oh, I'm so sorry. You don't notice any difference when he does. The look on Nick's face says it all. It's a look of mixed confusion and excitement. Hey, you alright? I'm fine. Just had an odd experience with that thing. You point to his watch. A scrambler? It was like I saw you three or four times at once. My eyes just couldn't focus. We figured out you weren't human, but his brain probably know quite how to place you. I imagine you've never seen a dragon before, Axel. Or at least not one with black scales. He looks at you as he asks the question. An epa. Dragons only exist in the stories in this world. Again, you have an urge to ask an obvious question. It would be a little weird to ask, wouldn't it? Could he breathe fire? You resist the temptation. This time. Nick looks at Max. That's awesome. And that's after all the things I learned in the last few days. Nick puts his hand forward and shakes Max's hand. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm Nick. Nice to meet you too. Max once again puts his hand forward for you to shake it. This time you shake his hand without issue. It's warm and soft and you to thought. That means you're... He looks like he's trying to remember something. Axel? Yup. Despite my initial reaction. Nice to meet you. You shake your head slowly. I mean, no offence, it's a little surreal still. Sorry. Oh, that's awesome. What? I guess that means I'm a living legend. Nah, it's an optimistic outlook. No question, but... Have you read any literature from Earth? Well, our take on creatures like you. About dragons? It's a favourite subject of mine, to be honest. Nick is usually fine. But... Asking someone likes reading about dragon just because he's a dragon himself. That's awkward. Oh, not yet. Do you have a favourite? <laughs> oh, it's an entire list. I had to bring some with me. The question pops up in your mind. How does space navigation work? As far as you know, you actually don't need to navigate, usually. It's all calculated ahead of time. Or it's only if something unforeseen happens, like rogue gravity waves or unavoidable sunstorms or... He sure is energetic. He finishes up his sentence with more than a few things, even some words you never heard before. The commander laughs at the enthusiasm. <laughs> In the unlikely case of anything unexpected happening, Max's job is to help guide us around it. There's no actual navigation to be done, if everything goes as planned. Do things go wrong on these trips? Max would have noticed the look on your face. Not that anything really has gone wrong yet. Max blushes a little. The commander lets out a tiny sigh, but keeps his smile. And now then. Would you like some coffee or tea before we meet Dr. Stevenson? Now that he mentions it, all break would be probably be good. After that unexpected experience. You suddenly feel a little tired. I sure have been so energetic, just exacerbated it. Quite the contrast. I wouldn't mind some tea. Well, I could go for some tea. A tea for both then. Alright. Anything for you, Max? I'll come help you out. I'll be right back then. The big bear leads the way down the corridor, the dragon following closely. You can hear Max talking a little bit too fast as they make their way to another room. Both you and Nick take a seat on the sofa as you wait. A dragon? I would never expect anything like it. He's pretty unique. There's a moment of silence. How did you know? You're going to have to clarify the question a little. <laughs> How did you know he was a dragon? I didn't. 
I didn't. Not fully. I expected him to not be human. But it's like my head imagined a tiger or a lion, even. I guess my brain didn't want to see him as human. I just couldn't piece it together. Nick raises an eyebrow at that. I think I understand what you're saying. You do have an eye for detail. I don't think it was anything special. Nick has a look like he's struggling to find the right words. I think you're selling yourself short. You might not think it matters, but... Nick is interrupted as Max arrives with a few paper cups in hand. He hands the cup to Nick with a smile. He seems a little calmer. Oh, thanks. Just a few seconds later, you notice Commander Steele approaching with a paper cup in each hand. He hands you the paper cup with a smile. Here you go. The tea smells just right. Well, thank you, Mike. We're ready to go meet the doc. Why well, reminds me, I need to go pick up a package for him. It's great to meet you, Nick and Axel. Bye. Take care, Max. And there he goes, just as quickly as he appeared. The commander waves at him as he leaves. The doctor's office just down the hall, if you're ready. Oh, yes, sir. The bear sighs softly and starts walking down the hallway, motioning for you to follow. The two of you trail after the bear. He leads you down the hallway and stops by a door marked Research Department. He knocks softly on the door. A deep voice responds. Yes? Where's Mike Steele? The door opens. In front of you is suddenly a large tiger. He's taller than Commander Steele. You can see why Nick was intimidated at first. The commander hands the tiger a paper cup. You must have gotten something to drink for him as well. Uh, thank you. Ah, Nick, welcome. Did you get any rest? Right there, Dr. Stevenson. There's a lot of information to take in yesterday. I'm more than ready. Can't wait. Well, good to hear. The tiger puts his hand over a handshake as he looks at you. Well, Charles Stevenson, it's a pleasure to meet you, Axel. Seems like everyone already knows who you are. Nice to meet you, Dr. Stevenson. He looks you up and down, studying you carefully. Welcome to Space Bear Productions. Or, oh, as you might soon come to know us, the crew of the Firefly. Although he's quite physically intimidating and has a stern look. He doesn't seem that scary. I wonder what Nick meant. Is that a spaceship? You're fairly sure that's what the commander called it in your interview. There's no harm in asking. Right? For some reason, all of a sudden, you feel really self-conscious. If you know the answer, why even ask? The stern look on his face combined with a few seconds it takes to get an answer is definitely helping your confidence here. And then... The nave is quite interesting due to a few reasons. What do you know of combustion engines? Isn't that just a normal engine? To him, I probably look pretty stupid. I should probably answer, still. In short, it's an engine that uses fuel to produce energy. I think. Not sure why I did that last part. I'm sure of what I said. He looks a little surprised. That's a good explanation. He doesn't think you're stupid? Now I feel stupid for expecting the worst. Maybe you do sell yourself short sometimes. The first prototype of the Firefly used combustion engines. It used to light up when it took off, just like a Firefly in light. So that's where the name comes from. The first prototype? Does it still look like a Firefly? I'd like to see it, sometime. Well, she looks different now, but she's still quite the sight. As our technologies advance, she's been rebuilt. There have been quite a few new versions of the ship. 
Thinking about it, the Firebird might have been a more fitting name. He smiles. Arising from the ashes. You can't overthink about the endless white. All that's left behind is a cloud of white ash. It seems like the tiger had the same thought. That's quite poetic. How do you respond to that? You don't have to as Nick continues the thought. Like a firebird fallen from the sky, rising from the ashes of its own demise. I think it's a romantic view. It's not the traditional love, but for the love of life itself. It rises from death itself and prevails. Charles looks towards Commander Steele. Uh, not one, but two poets? If Axel joins us, the journey home might be quite interesting. Let's have to explain our mission and convince him. The bear winks at you. It'd be a pleasure to have you along for the journey, Axel. You try not to read into that. I'll leave him in your care, Charles. He sighs. But try not to scare anyone this time. Without missing a beat and with a serious look, the tiger responds. It's important that they know any risks. It is. But no growling. You could swear the tiger actually looked like he was ashamed for a second. But by the way, Mike. Looks like these two take care of themselves, unlike you. What? The bear raises an eyebrow. You're the only coffee drinker here, Mike. Oh, now that he mentions it. Does this smell like some strong coffee? You should lay off this stuff. It's not good for you. Oh, three against one, huh? Even the stern-looking tiger smiles at that. The tiger chuckles softly. As even defines, the commander takes a sip of his drink. Well, let's get started then. We should be done at lunchtime, Mike. Well, send me a message, I'll be right over. With a wave, the bear turns around and leaves you with the doctor. Charles enters the room and motions you to follow. Looks like there's a large table prepared with seats and a whiteboard. This is the briefing of our mission. If you have any questions, just ask. As I mentioned earlier, it's preferable you know as much as possible about any potential risks. Nick takes a seat next to you. He looks to be quite excited about this. To summarise it, we have succeeded in entangling two physical spaces. As in, we have achieved quantum entanglement. And our mission? is to travel back to Arctos, the planet where I'm from, and set up a base on a nearby planet, where you will then help our engineers connect equipment from this world to our technology. This is in order to send data between the two worlds using the entangled areas. Arctos. What exactly is entanglement? The commander explained it a little, but I'm not versed in quantum physics. The tiger walks up to the whiteboard and picks up one of the markers. The tiger draws a small circle on one side of the whiteboard, and then another circle on the other side of the whiteboard. A quantum entanglement of two objects, or spaces in this case, can be explained like this. We link the two objects' properties to one another. He draws arrows on the orbs as to show as if it was spinning. That means, if we were to make one of the objects, for example, spin, he draws the same arrows around the other one. Then the other one would spin as well. They share properties, no matter where in the universe they are. He erases the circles on the whiteboard. Or would you like another example? Another example is if we were to flip two coins. 
If they were not entangled, one might land on heads and one might land on tails. Or they might both land on heads. Or both on tails. As to say, whatever the one does, it does not matter to the other. If they were entangled, however, they would both land on the same side, be it heads or tails. He looks like he just realised something. Actually, that's not quite true in this world. We'll call this a refined entanglement. In consideration of regular quantum mechanics, one would land on heads and one would land on tails. They would effectively function as one object, one being the head side and the other the tail side. Always opposite. I think I get it. Well, I'm glad. Would you like me to continue with one final example? Grunt's written all this stuff. Let's read it. I'll give you another example about the original idea of quantum entanglement. Imagine you order two items. Let's say you order a blue shirt and a red shirt. You know they'll arrive in different boxes, but the boxes themselves look identical. When you get one box and open it, you'll see one of the shirts. If you get the blue shirt first, you'll know that you got the blue shirt. So the second box to arrive will have the red shirt. They're in tangles as you order them. Two boxes containing different things. Heads and tails. This is a rough idea of what entanglement is. However, we've managed to manipulate the process as to bind them to mirror themselves. So, in our case, both would be tails, or both would be heads. Or, after ordering the red and blue shirts, we'd be able to change the colour of the second shirt, the red shirt, by manipulating the blue shirt. Because they're entangled. That's a rough explanation. Hopefully it was understandable. Things get more clear as the details get more complex. That's... a lot. It's hard to imagine it in reality, but... That makes sense somehow. Well, thank you. The tiger looks a little surprised at the last two words in your sentence. Uh, you're welcome. If quantum mechanics interest you, I'd be happy to tell you more about the Firefly at some point. Like how we don't use combustion engines, but instead harness extra-dimensional gravitational energy. That sounds... complicated. Your technology sounds way more advanced than anything from our world. It's different. He looks very serious at that. But in the end, we're the ones asking for your help. So, Axel, Nick has already agreed since yesterday. You know the essence of our mission. I understand the commander also told you about our enemy. The Endless White. What's your answer? To be honest, I'd like to know more about the Endless White first. Did the tiger just smile? Nick looks a little surprised. Mr. Wynn actually going to Arctos. There shouldn't be anything to worry about, should there? I'll tell you about it. And show you. Show us. Let's start with the explanation. Once again, he motions you to follow. He walks over to a desk and opens a small safe that's on top of it. He then brings out a small test tube with a cork in it. Inside it, there's what looks like ash. Is that the endless white? It's some of the ash left behind. The doctor brings it closer for you to see. You look intently at the test tube. It's strangely colourless. Not like it's white or grey. More like 
It's just an absence of what your brain would assume should be there. Somehow it just feels quiet. It's inert, as in it will not permanently damage you. But I'd like for you to touch it, Axel. Why specifically Axel, Doc? The tiger gives Nick an intense look. Because I believe he's more likely to give me an honest reaction of any danger he feels. Nick doesn't respond. The doctor's probably right. Nick can get a little carried away. You want me to touch it? I almost feel too shy to ask, but... And what's that about damage? It will sting and burn as you touch it. So do not hold on to it for long. I'd like to observe how it affects you physically. And it will give you a real idea of the threat of the mission. I thought we were not going to Arctos itself. We are not. However, I'd rather you prepare for the worst possible outcome. Should I really do this? The doctor did say that it was safe. Without risk, how do you move forward? You've been thinking that a lot recently. Fuck it. How do we do this? Put out your hand with the palm up. I'll put some on your palm. If it burns too much, you need to let go. Just turn your hand and let it fall on the table. That seems pretty simple. Maybe it really isn't that dangerous. You put your hand forward and turn your palm up. Nick is watching closely. The tiger opens a test tube and grabs some ash with some tweezers. He gently drops it into your hand. At first you don't notice anything special. It feels light. But then it's a slight tingling sensation. It slowly evolves into a very uncomfortable feeling. But there's no burning, like he said there would be. It's uncomfortable, but it does not burn. You take your other hand and move the ash with your finger. Interesting. There's no mark at all. No burning sensation at all? No. But you are very uncomfortable. It's like your mind is in panic. Almost like a headache without the pain. But... The tiger raises an eyebrow. It's like my mind is wanting to let go of it. It feels almost like I'm a child being yelled at. Or like I just woke up from a bad dream. Let go of it, Axel. You turn your hand upside down, the ash drops from your hand. The doctor picks it up with the tweezers and places it back in the test tube. Oh, seems like the idea of humans from this part of Earth being resistant is true. Now then. Take a minute and consider the mission. Then... You do have the chance to actually see another world. I'll go with you. The tiger looks like he's expecting more for a second, but then... Thank you, Axel and Nick. The two of you mean more than you think. I look forward to it. It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance, after all. You hear a growl. It's coming from the tiger. He's not growling. It's his stomach. Oh, perfect time for lunch. Oh, let's come out and know we're done. He sends a message on his phone and shortly after that the commander walks in the door. All set. Did Charles try and scare you off? And not at all. He was kind and informative. Did he bring out the whiteboard? He's quite good at teaching, and that whiteboard is quite remarkable. Charles lets out an audible groan at that. Well, I'm glad he didn't scare you off. You think the worst of me, Mike. He has an exasperated look on his face. 
You did do your best to scare Nick off. Oh, I trust you, Charles. That's why I asked you to do the briefing. It's about asking Axel's opinion if he's to be part of our crew. The tiger breaks into a smile. Oh, you're easy to tease, Mike. He's not wrong, you know. You're here, aren't you? I am. I did get to know everything from the start. All right, then. Time for some lunch, and I'd like to hear your decision, Axel. I'm going to get some lunch from a cafe down the street if you'd like to join me. I need to make a phone call, and I'll be heading to the hotel for a bit. I'll eat lunch there and do some work on my laptop. Make a list of what to bring. Not a bad idea. Well, I still have work to do. I'm just going to grab a snack and get to it. You're welcome to join me for lunch if you have more questions, Axel, about anything. You're interested in extra-dimensional energy? They do have some interesting technology. But... Yeah, walk sounds perfect, Mike. You're welcome to join me for lunch tomorrow instead, if you'd like, Axel. I'll plan for it. I'll drop you off at the hotel afterwards. It was a pleasure meeting you, Axel. The doctor grabs a small note from his pocket and writes something on it. Uh, here's my number. Call me at any point if you have any questions. Or if you just want to talk. That's sweet of him. Thanks for briefing. I'll see you all tomorrow. Well, I'll see you later then, Charles. Bye, Dr. Stevenson. See you later, Axel, Commander. The tiger smiles at you as you follow the bear out of the room. You take the elevator to the ground floor. As you exit the building, it's clear that the bear is happy about your choice to walk. He's even sneaking peeks at you when he thinks you're not looking. You can't deny you're also pretty excited. What could be a good time to ask a few questions? Maybe even some one-on-one -on -one time with the commander. He starts humming a tune you don't recognise. You can't help but wonder. Is that a tune from his world? That makes you think. You don't really know a lot about where you're supposedly going yet. You look over to the commander. He looks lost in thought, still humming and looking at the clouds above. The tune is quite relaxing. Is the sky the same as in his world? Are the clouds the same shapes? Is the colour the same? Does the air smell the same? What about food? Although, he did drink hot chocolate yesterday. Maybe I should ask. As you snap out of your daydream, you notice the commander is now looking at you. It looks like he notices you spacing out. Oh. He doesn't say anything, instead he looks up at the clouds again. Oh, beautiful. What? And as if, if he had read your mind? Well, the sky, that is. Oh. It is a beautiful day, isn't it? It is. He smiles at you. When I was young, I used to look at the sky and daydream. I dream about flying through the clouds. I thought I'd feel so free, able to go anywhere I wanted. It really was like that for a while, too. He sighs for a second and catches himself. Sorry to bore you with my ramblings. You must have a lot of questions. Let me know if there's anything you'd like to know. I'm not quite as technical as Dr. Stevenson, but I should be able to answer most things. If only there's quite a bit I'd like to ask. But I'd imagine there'll be time for that later. Could you tell me a little more about you? You catch yourself. Uh, about your world, for now. Well, Mike, it's the sky is the same. He looks at you and tilts his head. What would you like to know? It's a lofty question. You can't help but be curious. What's the sky like where you're from? The question seems to almost catch him off guard, but he quickly regains his composure. Well, it's similar to the sky you know. There are clouds, the sun, 
although it appears slightly larger than the one above us right now. The colours of the sky are deeper. It's a deep, deep blue, usually. The sky here looks so pale in comparison. He chuckles. <laughs> I could tell you the science behind it if you'd like. It'd be an interesting subject, wouldn't it? Besides, it's a way to learn more about where I might be going. At least that's the excuse you tell yourself. I like that. His face turns into an unexpected look of excitement. Oh, where to start? Do you know why the sky has colour? As in why the night sky is dark, black, and why the sky is blue right now? I remember some of it from school. I think it has to do with the light from the sun hitting the atmosphere. Oh, very good. That's exactly it. Colour, as we see it, is light reflecting off a surface. So any colour we see is just reflected light. It's being reflected by bouncing off something. In this case, the atmosphere as the sunlight reaches our eyes. What colour we see depends on the wavelength and strength of the light is reflected. There's a reason you might experience a cloudy day as grey or lacking of colour. It also depends on how we perceive it, depending on our genetics. It's very likely the sky looks different to you than it looks to me. I hadn't thought of that. Your genetics are definitely different after all. I wish I could see it how you see it. That slipped out. I was still surprised at that. But it would be interesting, wouldn't it? Maybe I can try to describe it to you. He looks to be lost in thought for a second. Uh, here. He brings out his phone and takes a picture of the sky. He holds the phone up so you can see it. It should look like the sky does right now to you. It does. Exactly the same, in fact. The commander turns his phone back and seems to be doing something on it. A minute later, he turns the phone back to you. No, I don't know if this is how you'd see this sky through my eyes. But this is almost how the sky in my world looked like, compared to the one here. In this kind of weather, that is. He looked closely at the screen of his phone. The sky is a more saturated, deep and intense blue. The clouds look like they're closer, due to the darker sky. Like you could reach out and touch them. Fluffy. It's different. I imagine it'd be hard getting used to. But it's beautiful. Well, I'm glad I could show it to you somehow. Even though it's not the answer to your original question, hoping it might help you imagine it a little bit. He seems really happy being able to teach you something. Thank you, Mike. Oh, you're welcome, Axel. Is there anything else you'd like to know? It's silly, but you can't have asking. It might be a little silly, but... What about the night sky? Are there more stars? How many moons? What about colour? Is it dark? Sorry, I'll have questions all at once. He just smiles at that. The night sky is still dark. Our sun sets at almost the same rate as in this world. We have two moons, Theoran and Theoma. As for the stars, the amount is about the same, but they are other stars, other constellations. Other constellations, they're also named after gods or myths. Some. Most are named after historical heroes or people who have changed the world. People who changed the world, huh? I'd like to have a star named after me. You want to be a hero? Not really. You remember a conversation you had with Nick once. You were both pretty drunk. Still, it had stuck with you. You'd reflect on something you'd said earlier, something you hadn't thought about, really. Sometimes I feel that like there's no place in the world for people like me. The question Nick had asked you was, 
What is happiness and fulfilment to you? What would it take to make you happy? To feel like you've gotten to where you want to be, done what you wanted to do. I think I want to change the world. Make it a better place somehow. He looks lost in thought for a little bit. Having a star named after you means a lot of people look up to you for answers. But I think it's a good way of leaving behind a legacy. It's a noble aspiration. I hope you get your wish, Axel. Thank you. You're normally not like this. Apparently you can help it, probably due to the flow of conversation. You keep on walking a little bit, neither of you saying anything. Eventually the commander breaks the silence. My mist flying through the sky. He used to be a pilot. Well, not exactly. Actually used to be a teacher. Not what you expected. During the day on my breaks I used to look at the clouds. Imagine what it'd be like to fly, soar into the clouds, to be free. And at night I'd look at the stars. Wanting to go further and find out what lay beyond. And then I joined the military. I got to go there. What I didn't bring into my calculations was all the responsibilities that came with the job. He looks up at the clouds again. Despite that, it was wonderful. Most of the time. Uh, sorry, I'm rambling again. I don't worry about it. I found it interesting. Thanks for telling me about your world. He smiles at you. You notice you stop just outside a cosy looking cafe. Oh, perfect timing. You went to the cafe and have lunch together. The commander asks you questions about Earth and networking. You ask him about Arctos. About the history and the nature. What kinds of creatures there are. It seemed your worlds are not so different. Afterwards, he walks you back to the hotel. You spend the rest of the day on your laptop, taking notes and making a list on what to pack. Before long, it's dinner time. You ponder what to eat. Maybe you should ask someone to join you. You decide to text the commander and ask him if he wants to grab something to eat. Hi, I was wondering if you would like to grab something dinner together. Maybe that's too casual. It does not take long to get the response. Well, I was just thinking about getting dinner somewhere myself. Well, I can come meet you at your hotel in ten minutes. There's a nearby restaurant that was recommended to me, if you'd like to go. That sounds perfect. Not too casual, then. You wait for him just outside the hotel. He greets you with a warm smile. Hi, Axel. I'm ready to go. Ready as ever. You start walking and chatting about the day. He seems excited to hear your take on things. That's your opinion about all the stuff you've learned. Even the endless white. You have an optimistic and realistic view at the same time. I admire that. It's easy to get lost in old memories and sorrows. After all, at least where I'm from, this time of the year is supposed to be a time of joy and happiness. But in reality, it's the opposite. Well, I think it's the contrast. It makes you think of lost loved ones, happiness that used to be. It makes the lonely feel more lonely, and it makes the sadness surface. And everyone has sadness and sorrows at some level. Bring back some dark memories of worse times. The world is a place of ups and downs. Where everyone has their regrets. Everyone has their demons. I think that in the end you just need to know either to chain them or to feed them. 
as a quote from my favourite poet. Just as you are the architect of your own demise, you also build your own future. On the alternate ending, added by some, fight if you have to, to make it a good one. Feed your optimism. You joining us on this mission makes me more optimistic. I'm fighting my demons and sometimes they end up winning. But when I see you look forward, I get the power to chain them. Maybe I said too much. Sorry. You can feel yourself blushing. Thank you. I've not done anything special yet, though. You look to be in deep thought for a minute as you walk. Will you tell me more about yourself, Axel? You tell him a little about your family. And about your job. You even tell him a little about your ex. And the breakup. He listens intently. Eventually he turns to ask more about your world and the conversation gets lighter for a little bit. And then... Oh, it was the briefing with Charles. It was informative. I learned a lot of things. Even about the thing you're fighting. The Endless White. It helped me make my choice. He looks surprised. I've been lonely in life. I felt like nothing I did ever mattered in the end. That regardless of my choices, I was lonely. That things would never get better. Like, my world had ended. That's why I'm going to help you fight for your world. It's almost like the world slows down. His look of surprise turns into a wide smile. And a second later you feel his arms around you. He pulls you into a warm hug. He's warm. And his fur is soft. Even though he has a lot of muscle. He smells good too. Thank you, Axel. I still didn't do anything yet. Well, that's not true. You help and save my entire world. Everything and everyone I care for. That is more than doing just something. He releases the hug. Suddenly, it is as if time starts again. Thanks for telling me your feelings, and listening to mine. It's important when the world feels like this. You can't help but blush. You can do the walk in silence, eventually arrive at the restaurant. You have dinner together with more light-hearted conversation. He smiles all the time. Eventually he walks you back to the hotel and bids you a good night. It does not take long for you to fall asleep. Today was a good day. Gotten to learn a lot about the people I'm going to work with. I've had some nice conversations. I've learned things. So that's where we're going to leave it. The end of chapter one. And the end of this episode of Distant Travels. And of course we'll be returning to it before too long, I hope. I still have to work up my schedules. But we're definitely carrying on with this VN. I hope you're enjoying as much as I am. And I know people who do enjoy my videos are the people who give me money on Patreon. I very much appreciate all of you and my donors on Ko-fi. And as always, I'd like to give a special mention to my top patrons. And they are Burnt Toast, Kartek, Cobus Visser, Legacy Butcherati, Lark Eskerton, Bastian, Brian Hall, Tiger Cub, Ida Corval, Anubis Silverwind, Dissonance, Grizz, Spiderling, Kopi, Sinu Dragowolf, Marcus, Evan King, Exac, Aaron Fox, Mohamed Alzamel, Andy Peng, Samuto, Omar, Big Booty Judy, Nova Starburn, and Vulpers Need Coffee. 
thanks to all of them. And a quick mention about another YouTube channel, Heart of Circuits. I'm doing some voice work for them, and I will continue when things move on with them. Is there? I'm not going to say too much about it, but there's a couple of videos out. I'm doing one of them. I'll be doing some more. There'll be something more from them in the hopefully not too distant future where I'll be doing some more voice work. If you want to go and check them out, Heart of Circuits on YouTube. You can see them on Twitter as well. I'll put a link in the description. Yeah, go and check out their channel. I think uh, they'll welcome you uh, checking them out and you might find some interesting stuff to watch there. And say so I will be doing more for them. So you can do a quick sub, you'll find out what's going on there. I'm not going to keep telling you about them. But I guess there is more distant travels coming up. Uh, we have more arches, more password, uh, more smoke room this month. I'm not exactly sure how everything's going to work out because as you were down to when people release things. So uh, I will figure that out and we'll sort something out. There'll definitely be more Remember the Flowers, which I've been trying to do for a few weeks now but I have not had the time unfortunately but uh, I will get to it as soon as I can uh, again, depends on everything else going on yeah it's one of those times but that is it for now I will let you go on your own maybe not so distant travels whatever it is you have to do now see Mike's not the only one who makes bad jokes I can do it as well but until next time which might be the week or might be on the weekend, I don't know. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.